So when you're handling malware, you want to remember first and foremost, your ethical hacking has to remain within the defined boundaries, within the parameters and scope that you've defined early on. You know what systems you're going to compromise. You know what kinds of compromise you're allowed to perform and what kinds you're not allowed to perform. So even if you find systems without malware scanners, unless you're specifically authorized to implement malware as a type of ethical hack approach, do not do it. And even when you're allowed to implement malware, only do it in very, very isolated conditions, meaning a clone server that's in an air-gapped system, the system that's not connected to the rest of the network, uh, a system that is cloned off and kept without a network card, or if it's on a network, it's on a network with only one other system and not connected to the backbone, not connected to the internet, not connected to even a proxy server, completely isolated, and then determine whether it's vulnerable to malware. That's the best approach. Otherwise, this thing could get out, and if it gets out on the target network, you may not be able to keep it within the boundaries. It's really hard to explain to a piece of code that you have an agreement with the chief executive officer that says that you're going to keep this malware on these systems within these hours. Well, the worm doesn't really care. It's going to go absolutely berserk on the network. So just be really cautious about where you use this. So now that those disclaimers are over, understanding which kind of malware to use in which case. Self-replicating worms or viruses are nice in that they actually are more of a denial of service type approach. They'll saturate the network. They will inundate systems with CPU load or memory load. Uh, they'll consume hard drive space and bandwidth. So these self-replicating types of malware are best for denial of service attacks where you just want to saturate things. On the other hand, viruses are specifically designed to destroy data. So in a type of attack where you're trying to determine whether a system is vulnerable to data loss or data corruption, uh, data manipulation in any way, or even just simply getting taken offline entirely, not just a denial of service, but a, 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 a system compromise of a widespread nature, viruses might be the right way to go. These also have the effect typically of destabilizing a system, rebooting a system, causing a system to blue screen or crash or, or hard hang, things like that. So if that's what you're looking to footprint or what you're being asked to test for, that's the type of malware you want to unleash potentially. And then Trojans, again, are more of a, a subtle, more of an elegant type of attack where they're useful for things like capturing user activity, monitoring a user network utilization, uh, reading confidential email or, or files on a user's machine. Most common on things like, well, our executive suite is protected really carefully, or this engineering group over here handles sensitive data and we want to ensure that there's no compromise against the data in that engineering group. Trojans might be the right way to go there because you're not denying service, you're not blatantly attacking, you're not destroying, you're actually just trying to see if you can sniff and capture. Backdoor attacks are, again, very successful, mostly because they look like typical or, or legitimate administration to a lot of admins. Again, if, if admins, you can see this list here, use VNC or LogMeIn or GoToMeeting or WebEx or any of these things, on a common basis, if you've got a, a site license or corporate uh, membership for WebEx, well, WebEx on a server is probably not going to be something that they're going to worry about. But you might have installed it so that you can remotely connect at any time. Or VNC, again, might be a typical implementation in a data center where people can't get to administer servers common, uh, very often rather, they can't physically get to the servers, great then install VNC of your very own. Maybe you can install a second or third or fourth instance or a separate terminal service type implementation on that same machine. It's probably going to go undetected. And oftentimes you don't even need to exploit these types of backdoor plants. For an ethical hack, a lot of times all you really need to do is prove that the backdoor has been implemented and that you can get back to it. And you don't actually have to use it for further attacks. That might be the threshold of where you go with that. You document it, you log it, you screen cam that you can get into it, and then you remove it. Or you leave it in place until you're authorized to remove it. That kind of thing. 
So it gives you some flexibility without actually causing any harm. And because it doesn't cause any harm, you probably can use it for further attacks depending on your scope. Remember that covering your tracks consistently is an important goal throughout the ethical hacking approach. So using malware to actually erase evidence of your intrusion is kind of nice. There's some types of malware that you can plant that will erase event logs, that will actually clean up files and folders, that will hide network traffic and so forth. Uh, for example, a, a proxy server might do a really good job of helping you tunnel through a sensitive area of the network without leaving any trace or without being detected by intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems on the network. So preventing any evidence from getting left in the first place or erasing evidence that's there is another interesting use of malware. It really entirely depends on the payload you select. Not so much whether you can use malware, it's what type of malware do you use. And in this case, Trojans are typically the most common because they're the ones that are going to be a little more elegant and can, over time, monitor for and get rid of evidence. Ultimately, the results of planting malware are going to be potentially, the, the most common one certainly is data destruction, destroying systems, destroying data, wrecking systems, you know, trashing servers and networks. That's the most common type of, of perception of malware attack. And certainly without the knowledge of what to do and without really careful steps, it's really easy for malware to get out of control and actually commit a lot of destruction. At the same time, there's great aspects of malware attacks as part of ethical hacking, like being able to monitor systems in a stealthy way, being able to re-enable entry to systems without having to re-attack being able to both cause and prevent downtime, being able to both cause a denial of service attack, maybe at an off hour or during a defined window, but then roll it back and actually stop the denial of service from happening. Those are all potential effects of planting malware. From an attacker perspective, malware is almost always used to cause direct immediate harm like viruses and worms, but that doesn't mean that that's the only way it can get used. An attacker can use malware the exact same way you're using it for elegant attacks or re-entries. There's a lot of examples out there of malware attacks that have only enabled re-entry and then the attacker never comes back because maybe they got scared, maybe they figured out that there was some monitoring going on, or maybe they didn't know their attack was successful. But that just shows you that malware can be effective as a stealth technology as well as a brute force technology. And then finally, one kind of final use of malware. I actually like to use malware in very limited scenarios for testing anti-malware solutions. So, for example, a company might hire me to come in and, and determine whether virus scanner or malware scanner A, B, or C would be the best for their environment. Well, certainly I'm going to check deployment. I'm going to make sure it deploys cleanly. I'm going to make sure it doesn't destabilize the system. I'm going to take a look at the company. I'm going to take a look at the reputation. But at some point, I'm going to want to install these things and then try to infect them, try to ins infect the system that they're running on to see if they stop an attack and if they do how well they do against an attack. And in those cases, I need to use malware. I need to package up a Trojan. I need to actually use a construction kit to build some of these uh, attack bits of code and attack the systems. In those cases, the most important thing I can do is isolate the test environment, actually get an air-gapped rig with clients and servers, whatever I'm going to need, get it on its own separate network or on no network at all, and then test the malware, test the actual solution by infecting it, and then finally actually wiping it out when I'm done, because there's some types of malware that can't be detected or can't be easily cleaned. And the only real way to do this is to actually nuke the site from orbit, to actually destroy the environment. That doesn't mean physically take the hard drive and chop it up with an ax. That probably means more delete the entire operating system, actually remove the partition, delete the data, all that kind of stuff, and get rid of it entirely so that there's no trace of the malware. But oftentimes, that's really the only way to thoroughly test an anti-malware solution to ensure that it actually works. 
And depending on the solution, there may be an email-based solution or a firewall-based solution. Same kind of thing. I probably need to take that entire solution into a lab with clients, with servers, with some intermediate network, but again, isolated from the rest of the network, from the rest of the environment, unleash the malware there, and when I'm done, clean the whole thing up to ensure there's no remnants of malware that are going to come back and bite me. Remember that there's some types of malware that are self-replicating and autonomous and will just wake right back up and start attacking if I don't get rid of them completely. So you've got to nuke the site from orbit. It's really the only way to be sure.